Praise the Lord. If you got your Bibles tonight, turn with me to the book of Acts. That's not A-X-E, that's A-C-T-S. Oh, in the English language, such a wonderful language. Amen. So many words that sound alike, not spelled the same, have different meanings. Won't it be wonderful there when there they will find out what they are doing there? That was a play on words so that you understand how difficult the English language is. Amen. Let me do it again. I don't know if I can or not. Won't it be wonderful there when they're finding out what they're going to do there? That was nowhere near what I said the first time, and you know it and I know it, but it involves some of the same words. Nah, nah. We get to heaven, I hope we all talk in the Holy Ghost. Amen. That'll be all right with me. I've been taking lessons down here. Amen. Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Just one verse of scripture tonight. Maybe some of the saddest words in the Bible. I don't know. It just depends upon your perspective, I suppose, and how you view that. But notice, if you will, what it says. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. The going out on the first missionary journey, John and Barnabas, or Paul and Barnabas, rather, and they're taking John Mark with him. That's who that John is that we're referring to there, John Mark. He and Barnabas are related by blood. He's been excited to hear of the things that God is doing in the Jewish community and specifically in the new found church, the, 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 the infant church. John Mark wants to be a part of it. He signs up. And then he leaves. Father, in the name of Jesus, help me tonight. As I put all this down, God, Lord, and begin to try to make it take shape and make sense to me, my hope and my prayers is it will take shape and make sense to these that I'm speaking to tonight. Because, God, I truly believe with all of my heart, God, there is a call upon every believer and to the degree, Father God, that we answer it will be to the degree that you will one day judge us about it. Help us to learn, God, tonight what it is to be willing to fail. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Everybody said amen. I want to ask you that question. Are you willing to fail? Yeah, that's what I said. Are you willing to fail? Or are you only willing to succeed? Now you see the point of the question. If you're only willing to succeed, you're probably never going to try. But if you're willing to fail, you'll try. And you'll try again and again and again. I'm just curious, is anybody here in the church tonight or even you that are watching by live stream, have you ever started something that you were so excited to be a part of that you couldn't wait for it to get rolling? And before you even really got started in what you were excited about, you quit. I mean, you just flat out stopped. You quit. No takers tonight, huh? I have to believe in my heart there are many of you that are raising your hand on the inside but not willing to show it on the outside. How's that? It's like the little boy that got in trouble at home and his mama sent him to the corner because he was rowdy and would not pay attention. She swatted his backside, said, you stand in this corner until you can learn to behave like a good little gentleman. The little boy stood there and he stood there and he stood there. Finally, he turned around to his mother. He said, I may be standing on the 
outside, but on the inside, I am running around and jumping and having the time of my life. And that's the way some of us are. In our mind, in our spirit, we are, oh, but on the outside, we have pulled back. We have downthrottled, if you will. John Mark was such a guy. John Mark, as I said a while ago, a cousin to Barnabas, has heard all the exciting stories about what Jesus is doing and the lives of people that have been changed ever since the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. John Mark is excited. He comes and says, can I please go with you and Paul on this, your first missionary trip? And they agreed to let him go. And so he joined this first missionary trip teen. He, he was young. He was so young. He, he, he wasn't a teenager, but he was young. He, he was young and immature, if you will, on so many levels, but he was lured. Lured by the promise of unseen and unknown areas of the world in his life. Hearing what Paul and Barnabas had to say about the work of the kingdom of God, that, that just excited him that much more. And oh, what a thrill it must have been for him as he boarded the ship there and began to watch as they disconnected the ship from its moorings and began to set the sail and pulled away from the dock heading west towards the island of Cyprus. And there they would begin the first part of their journey having made it that far. Now John Mark was ready to do this. Don't misunderstand John Mark at all if you would please. He did desired to become a missionary. He knew there were people that needed the Lord. He realized that he just could not wait to get started talking about Jesus and sharing about Jesus and praying with people and seeing them come to the Lord and be delivered of all of their sin. But there was something that Mark was not prepared for. John Mark was not prepared to fail. I don't know how many people I've seen in the ministry who got started good, but they weren't prepared for what didn't go right. I just want to go on record and say, if you're called to the ministry, get ready, get ready, get ready. Amen. There's this lawyer, this lawyer whose last name is Murphy, and he has written several laws and that one law that gets virtually all of us is if it can go wrong, oh, you know him, do you? I see some of you may have possibly studied under him and graduated. Some will shout louder. Amen. Thank you. You got that. Thank the Lord. One person got that joke here. Do you understand that we do our best to encourage people to be successful at the ventures that they go forth in for the Lord, but we never prepare them to fail. We never prepare them for what if it doesn't go the way it's supposed to. I'd love to tell you in the nine years plus that I've been here, praise God, everything we put our hand to went A-OK, number one. Baloney. And the Greek word is salami. I'm here to tell you straight up, it just doesn't happen. Notice what took place. Once they had landed at Cyprus, they got there, and John Mark knew right away that he was a long way from home. John Mark couldn't see his mama's house anymore. John Mark didn't recognize a temple that they could go into for a Jewish believer of Jesus Christ and be able to worship him. There was nothing, nothing of the civilization that he had been used to being around while he lived there in Jerusalem. The truth of the matter was simply this. John Mark was afraid. He was absolutely scared. He was struggling to breathe. It felt like the area around him was a giant vice that was just squeezing him and squeezing him and squeezing him. And to top it all off, <laughs> be assured somebody who's close to you will tell you something good. Barnabas said to him, oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till we leave Cyprus and go to Pamphylia. 
When we get to Pamphylia, you need to know there are prisons there and we're probably going to wind up spending the night in a couple of them while we're there. You need to be aware there are hostile natives that live there who are not very friendly. You need to know there's deadly snakes everywhere you go. No matter where you step, you need to be careful where you step because those snakes will probably get you. There are un charted courses that we're going to have to take that maybe no one has ever taken before and above all else watch out for the swamps the swamps there are constantly offering you the possibility of contracting malaria and you could get very sick or worse you could die in pamphylia that's it I quit I don't know what the travel brochure was that he was looking at when he decided to become a part of the missionary team and began to look at maybe the pictures that were available to him to show him the crystal white sandy beaches. Hello. Or the beautiful palm trees that swayed in the gentle hurricane-style winds that blew. But all of a sudden, it was more than he could handle. That's it, he said. I quit. And just that quick, John Mark got his stuff together, found a ship that was going back to Jerusalem, paid for his passage, and waved goodbye as Barnabas and Paul could not believe their eyes. I want to ask you this question. Are you willing to try and maybe fail? You ever start a new job? Wasn't it everything that they promised you it would be and then some? Amen. Didn't it just go so smoothly from the time that they sat down and shared all of your duties and all the things that were expected of you? Didn't it just, praise God, come together and you thought, wow, I'd wished I'd done this sooner. I don't know how many times I've gone into a church, this one included, not knowing what was going on, thinking I had some kind of an understanding only to find out I didn't know anything. And I'm here to tell you, all of a sudden I'm like, what are you going to do? I confess I've left some places because of the simple fact I did not feel it was the will of God for me to be there even though I was told it was. It's amazing how many people will tell you what the will of God is for you who really don't have a clue in the world what it is. You listen to this preacher and you listen to him real good. Friend, if God's called you to something, God will make it known to you and not necessarily through the mouths of people around about you. God will confirm it to you again and again in so many different various ways. But you need to know and understand, friend, that there are just sometimes there's some people, they don't have a clue but they like you and they want you to hang around. They want you to stay with it and stick with it and don't give up. More than one preacher has made this statement. The times are crucial, they have said. We can't afford to fail. But friend, is that the main reason that many of us don't even try anymore? It's because we're afraid that we will fail and we don't want people to talk about our failure and talk about us as failures. So we don't even attempt, we don't even try and we just let the opportunity come and go. You see, it's not about success or failure, it's about whether or not we're even trying. I keep hearing the reports. They tell me as many as 5,000 up to 10,000 ministers a month are leaving the ministry. I just got to be honest with you. I didn't know there were that many of us. I mean, that's a lot of people. Somebody say amen. That's 60 to 120,000 ministers. And I'm talking in America only who have given up and walked away from the ministry never to darken the door again. At all. Period. I'm so glad there are those that have learned what their skills are, what their calling is, what it is that God has called them to do. But the thing that really troubles me the most is when people 
absolutely just walk completely away from it as though it was nothing much to it anyways, anyhow. I'm here to tell you, friend, we need to understand that if God calls you, the calling of God is without repentance. That's not what I said. That's what God said in his word. Too many people absolutely don't understand. It's not something you just walk away from. You may retire from it. I can hope. You, you may get to the point where that your health comes down upon you. I had a good friend of mine. He absolutely was one of the most gifted men I've ever known in my life. Could take the guitar and make me look like I just started playing it. He played so well. He, he is on the guitar what you are on the keyboard. Let me put it that way. But then again, as I think about you, you're on the guitar like you are on the keyboard. Amen. And you make me mad. In, in, a, in a godly, loving kind of way. I'll just show you now. Amen. Brother J.C. came up with a condition. His condition could not necessarily be treated by medication to where he could continue in the ministry. What kind of a man was this? This was a man who knew Greek. I don't mean a few Greek words. I mean he knew Greek. He could take the literal, the literal scrolls that were written in Greek. He could read them. He could interpret them. He could write down from the original scrolls if they were allowed, allowing him to do so. He could write down the word of God and give a far greater English translation of the word. I don't know why God allowed this thing to come up on him. There were people that put him down. There were people that, that talked ugly about him. There were people that made fun of his situation. And I felt for J.C. I mean, anybody that's got the initials in their name that's the same initials as Jesus Christ, I, I kind of like a person like that. Somebody say amen. And I'm here to tell you straight up, it broke my heart the more I talked with him and realized that this man was not able to fulfill what he had prepared himself for, what he had trained himself for, what God had called him into. You could see it in his face and you could hear it in his words when he would speak and you would realize it wasn't coming together like he planned. He was in his own mind somewhat of a failure. God used him. God used, to reach, used him to reach people, not so much in a church setting or in a revival setting or whatever setting you want to speak of towards the church, but he used him on his job to reach people because he wound up being a security guard. His only hope would have been that he could have found one that was run by Greeks. He could have communicated with them in his own language. I've often wondered if he shouldn't have done that because he would have been an asset to them being an American who speaks Greek. You see, the whole problem was while he was willing to do what it took to succeed, I don't know that he ever considered the what if aspect of it. The real question is, are we at least willing to try? Whether or not we succeed or fail is not nearly as important as the willingness of us just to simply try. How many ministers haven't been willing to try and pastor a church because of what they prematurely heard about that church or that area. How many have ever attempted to teach a class or never have attempted to teach a class because they had already heard what was going on in that class, what was existing in that class, the reputation that it had as being hard? How many marriages have failed simply because a husband and a wife did not take the time to try, be willing to try to work things out, to possibly be humiliated in the process, to be misunderstood or alienated by family or friends simply because they tried to work it out? How many unsaved people have walked away from Jesus Christ only because they couldn't live the life? Newsflash, none of us can. Whew, not an amen in the bunch. I got no, you can't live it. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you can't live it. Don't worry about what they think about you. Tell them, you can't live it. You don't have the power. You don't have the ability. Honey, you need to depend upon God to help you to live this life as a child of God. Without him, you can't make it. Somebody now say amen. 
Yeah, you just didn't know where I was going with it. I get it. You need to grab a hold of the fact some people can't make that commitment. They got things to do, places to go, people to see. I don't have time for Jesus. Friend, you better make time. Because if you don't do it now, be assured one day you will. One day you will. In some cases, some people aren't even willing to try. If you try, there is the remotest of possibilities that you might fail. Listen to me. Not a guarantee that you will fail. There is a possibility. A possibility. But can I tell you something? There's a greater chance that you will succeed at some level more than fail. I want to say that again. Amen. There's a greater chance that you will succeed at some level more than you will fail. But because we've put it in our head that if we fail, we're done. Wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. You need to hear what the Word of God says. Philippians 4 and 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Say it again. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You need to understand, friend, it doesn't matter whether you're successful, the number one person in your effort, or whether you're dead last. I would rather come in in a class of 400 at number 400 and know that I tried, I tried, I tried, than to never have my name mentioned whatsoever as even getting off the seat, getting off the chair, getting on my feet, getting to where I need to be to at least give it a try. Preach, brother. No, oh, I'm going to. Shout with me or against me. I don't care. I won't be able to tell the difference right now anyways. Hello. In this life, in this life, if you're going to succeed at some level, you've got to be willing to try. You've got to be willing to attempt. You've got to be willing to dream and dare. And you've got to be willing to put your trust in God. Friend, if you're going to make it the greatest, if you're going to be the greatest at whatever you attempt, you'll never know if you can be until you try, 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 try again. If at first you don't succeed, what? What? One try out of you. The rest of it, try, try again. Try it one more time. If at first you don't succeed. Oh, see, that didn't hurt a bit, did it? You failed the first time, but you succeeded the second time. Thank you for proving my point. Come on. I don't Look at me like that all you want. I'm going to preach this because some of you need to hear it. You've absolutely hit a brick wall and you think, well, it's over now. Honey, the brick wall will come down. How do you know? I have it in the word of God that on the seventh day they marched seven times around the brick wall. And when they finished up and the last foot came around on the seventh trip, praise God, the walls came down. Somebody say amen. You may run up against the wall. It may seem like it's greater than you. It may seem like it's never coming down. But if you do what God said to do, even when it seems foolish to do it, even when it seems ridiculous to keep trying, even though friend, the people that are living on the wall are making fun of you and throwing stuff at you and cursing you and all manner of things, my God keep marching in the name of Jesus because on the seventh time around God's going to bring the wall down, somebody say amen, oh he's preaching now, Woo! hallelujah there are some keys to help you. Keys are important. You got my keys, right? Just checking. Just so happens I have more. <laughs> keys are important. On this key ring helps me start my car, helps me start my truck. On this key ring helps me get in and out of the house. On this key ring, I got a key for the lock on my utility shed. This key ring won't help me with anything here in this building. That key ring will. I have them in order so I know what's what, how to find it. You know how some people are? They got a great big wad of keys on the end of a chain that they can pull from their, you know, their kidneys. It's what it looks like it's attached to. 
and they go through key after key after key. Come, don't look at me like that unless you're that person. Forgive me for picking on you. I put them in order so I know which way to start with it. I know which side to start with the outside, and I know which ones to start with the ones on the inside. I know what to look for. I know what to expect. And every once in a while, I would come across a lock in this place, and I don't know if I got a key or not. Then I'll get rid of the keys to the side that I know go to specific certain things, and then I got about a half a dozen or so, and one at a time. If it goes in, oh, there's hope. If it turns, success. If it doesn't, I go to Shirley. <laughs> Amen. Here's some keys for you. Are you ready? Keys to help you to not quit. Number one, the first key is the key of forgiveness. You hearing me? The key of forgiveness. You know who you need to forgive? The hardest person in the world for you to forgive? Anybody got a mirror on you? Look at yourself. You are the hardest person to forgive. You're harder on you than anybody else. And if you're not, you're messed up. I'm here to tell you one of the hardest people that you'll ever find to forgive is yourself. Why? Because of what you did, because of what you said, because of where you went, because of what you did or did not do. The list just goes on and on and on. you got to learn how to forgive yourself. Somebody said, well, that sounds a little bit selfish. Friend, it's not. It's not a bit. I'm here to tell you, it's like being on an airplane. They go through that process and they say, if the, the cabin should depressurize, suddenly a compartment will open up overhead. And when it does, there'll be a mask that will come down. You won't be able to sense the oxygen coming through the tube into that mask. Hurriedly, put your mask on first. Why? Because, friend, if you pass out, the clown next to you may still be fumbling with their mask. Put your mask on, and then you can help somebody else sitting on either side of you. Our problem is we try to help too many people when we ourselves are not in the proper shape or condition to help anybody else. Oh, he's preaching good now. So put yours on first. And when it comes to forgiveness, start with you. Second, you need to forgive others and especially those who hurt you. And honey, let me tell you, that garden grows rich and full. The flowers of idiocy are in abundance. They will absolutely do more damage to you than you can shake a stick at. They'll hurt you in ways you didn't know you could be hurt. They'll hurt you over things that you didn't know you were dainty about. The key of forgiveness involves forgiving situations in your life that have led you to a place of immobility. I know people who have literally, literally put themselves in their homes and they never go out. They never open up the blinds. They never open up the door. They're embarrassed when somebody comes over to the house. They absolutely, absolutely tried their best to build up the walls to prevent anything or anybody from coming in on them. And for them, the old adage that misery loves company, they just love misery. first key you need is the key of forgiveness. The second key you need, you need the key of truly liking yourself. Say, what? You say, well, that's pride. No, it's not. Let me prove it to you. I'm going to prove it to you not from some psychologist or some psychiatrist. I'm going to prove it to you from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You know what Jesus had to say? Jesus said this, love yourself. No. Love your neighbor as, see, I gave it away, didn't I? We were taking a test. You just made 100. Our problem is, is Jesus wants us to love our neighbor. Who's our neighbor, he was asked? Who's around you? Hello? Well, I don't know them. You don't have to know them to be neighborly. 
But if you're going to love them, you need to love them like you would love yourself. You need to like yourself. You need to understand that if you can't love, if you can't love you, come on. See husbands and wives looking at one another. If you can't love you, I mean, okay, really like yourself. If you can't love yourself, at least really like yourself. But if you can't, you can't really love others. The Word of God says plain and simple that God is love. And before you can love anybody else, you've got to come in contact with him. And his love is supposed to spur you to love others. But the fact of the matter is, some of us hate ourselves so much, there's no room for God's love to come in and make a difference. And we need, we need to do that. Let me explain it one step further and I'll move along. What value you must hold in this world? You ever think about it? Satan values you so much, he wants to take you victoriously to hell. God so vicariously loves you that he absolutely wants you to come to heaven with him. Jesus loves you so much, he gave his life and died for you so that he could pay the price for your sin. And the Holy Spirit loves you so much that he wants to develop you into the child of God that you need to be. So don't tell me that your life was without value. That's a bunch of garbage. You are worth more than you imagine. Amen. Well, my spouse doesn't love me. How do you know? Challenge them. Amen. My children don't love me. How do you know? My grandparents, my aunt, my uncle, my pastor. Oh, hallelujah to God. You don't care. You'll never come around. You'll never ask me to. Hello. You know, if you're going to have friends, what does the Bible say? Be friendly. I've been to some of y'all's houses because you said, come on over. Some of you said, if you're in the area, i got to figure out where your area is at. But I can tell you this much. It's absolutely ludicrous for us to think that we have no value in life because so-and-so doesn't come and see us or call us or whatever us. Good preaching. Third key. Only going to give you three tonight. Don't want you to go crazy. Get too many keys on that ring. It'll jingle. You need the key of being willing to try again. Thomas Edison, y'all, y'all know of Thomas Edison, right? Some of y'all actually took American history and he was a part of it, amen? Great inventor over 100 years ago. Thomas Edison had an invention of his that he had 1,000 in a row failures. And on the 1,000th and first attempt, he found success. He was told repeatedly, you're losing it, man. You absolutely have no clue in the world what to do. He said, well, I've got a thousand clues what not to do. Come on. He didn't see his failures as failures. He saw the inability to find what it was that he was looking for. But on 1,001, it finally came through. I believe they referred to that as a light bulb. And the truth of the matter is, folks, we need to come to the understanding that failure is an option. I don't think you said that right. Let me look at my notes. Yeah, I did too. Failure is an option if we don't stop trying to succeed. Well, Pastor, I tried it before. And it didn't work. Try it again. Well, I can't do it 
Like we, we just don't do it like that around here. Maybe we ought to. Come on. Maybe we ought to. Maybe we ought to try something different. Maybe we ought to tweak it just a little bit. Maybe we ought to tighten it just a little bit. Maybe we ought to loosen it a little bit. Maybe we ought to do something we've not done before to see if we can't get a different result. Amen. Because the definition of crazy is doing the same thing the same way and expecting different results. Preach on. I'm bringing it to a close. John Mark quit. Quit. If I'm going to get stoned, I don't want to do it with Paul and Barnabas. They use real stones. If they're going to leave the light on for me, I don't want it to be the local prison. I don't want to be having to step over snakes. I don't want people trying to kill me just because I'm not from around here. I've made up my mind. I quit. And he went home. Got on that ship, did a 180, went back to Jerusalem, back to his mama's house, back to the temple where he already knew they were under persecution. Went back to everything that he knew before that did not satisfy. And the fact of the matter is when you read the book of Acts, you'll find and read about the compassion and the commitment and the devotion and the intercession of Barnabas and Paul and Silas. You read on a little bit further, you'll find out as a direct result of their ministry We read about Luke who was always traveling with Paul and writing down what was going on. We got the letters that he wrote to Timothy and to Titus and others who followed in the footsteps of Paul and Silas as well as Barnabas. But Mark is not mentioned. Mark is not mentioned in the book of Acts after he turned around in Cyprus until Acts chapter 15 verses Three and four. But not necessarily in a good way. Barnabas had gotten news that John Mark had changed. And he's contacted Barnabas and said, I want another chance. I want to go back out with you again. If y'all go back out, I want to go back out with you. Barnabas said, you know, John Mark, nothing's changed about where we've been. We, we have some churches that we've started, but they're all in people's homes. We don't have a, a temple. We don't have a building that you can go to and enjoy. Are you sure? Yes, please. Please, Cousin Barnabas, let me, let me go back out with y'all again. Well, let me talk to Paul. I could almost see John Mark roll his eyes. Barnabas contacted Paul and said, look, I I know you're talking about going back out and visiting the churches that we started up on our first trip around. He said, "Uh, I got contacted by John Mark and Paul, there's been a change in him. He's not the same person he was before. I can tell. Just just talking with him, Paul, I I think this will be good. Paul said, no. He said, that little twerp abandoned us. We got to our first place and he abandoned us. He left us. We hadn't even got started and he left. No, no, he's not coming. Come on, come on, Paul. You know, do I dare bring up to you what would have happened to you if no one had given Paul a chance over Saul of Tarsus? Don't don't you start that with me. The Bible says it became a contentious thing. They argued about it. Became a problem between Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas didn't want to go with Paul. Paul wasn't sure that he wanted Barnabas to go with him. But he knew for sure, I don't want John Mark having a thing to do with this. 
Well, I'm taking him. Well, you'll go without me. Fine, I'll go without the great Paul. I can. Oh, can't you just hear him? You say, they didn't say that. How do you know? Were you there? I'm t- I've, I've watched guys who loved one another and cared about one another and they had a breakdown in regards to who they wanted to be around. Friendships ended. The Bible says that Barnabas took John Mark and Paul chose Silas. Paul and Silas, they went first to the north towards Syria And after they had been to Syria to the places that Paul had visited and done a work for the Lord, they headed west to Cilicia. But Barnabas, when he got John Mark, you know where they went? They went back to Cyprus. They went back to the place that he quit. The place where he failed. Because if John Mark was going to stand any chance beyond and on the road to wherever else they had been, he had to overcome Cyprus. Unfortunately, Luke traveled with Paul and Silas. And that's how we know about the adventures of those two. Apparently, neither Barnabas nor John Mark could write. Because we're not told what happened. In order to succeed beyond your failure, sometimes you have to return to the scene of the crime. And you have to overcome that. It's a few years later, Paul has been placed under arrest. He's in Rome and he's writing letters as quickly as he can. He's writing the last letter that he would ever write to Timothy. And he says to him in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I need you to come quickly. Please bring the cloaks, the coats. It's kind of chilly up here. And bring the parchments with you when you come. I'm not sure if those were blank or whether they were letters that had been sent to Paul. And just before he closes out the letter, the last letter that he would write to Timothy, he writes these words in what we call chapter 4 and verse 11. Get John Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me for ministry. The kid that quit, the young adult who changed, something powerful has happened in the life of John Mark. And now he's useful for ministry. I'm gonna share something with you. Share something with you You may have been to your Cyprus. You may have gone somewhere where it didn't come together and it didn't work. And you were scared and terrified. You found it hard to breathe. It felt like the place around you was just just like a boa constrictor wrapped around you and squeezing the life out of you. Paul went down a list of sins in his letter to the Corinthians. You were terrible. You sinned with every word you spoke, with every action you took, you sinned. People knew you by the sin that you committed. And I'm here to tell you, people who commit those kind of sins are not going to make it into heaven. but you've been washed. You've been changed. 
You've been sanctified. The glory of God is upon you and within you and you're not the same anymore. And I'm here to tell you, I don't care what you've done. I don't care how you've failed. I don't care how horribly it went. There's a God in heaven that says, I can take care of that. I can handle that. Give it to me. And then from heaven, Jesus will say, Holy Spirit, bring them to me for they are useful to me for ministry. Are you willing to fail after you've tried, not before? If so, God can use somebody just like you. Father, in Christ's name, touch us tonight. I want to believe in my heart, God, that every person here, God, under the sound of my voice in this house has never failed you. Or if they have, God, they got over it. And now, God, they're doing a work for you like never before. Something, God, that they didn't feel like they could do, God, because it was beyond them. Well, God, it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be within our comfort range. It's supposed to stretch us and push us to the limit so that we look to you and depend upon you. And I'm asking you in the name of Jesus Christ, God, help us. If we reach a place, God, Lord, where our wheels are spinning in the proverbial mud, then God help us in the name of Jesus just to stop long enough to get something there, God, to give us some traction and move us out, God, Lord, so that we can move forward and not just be stuck in that failure, but God, Lord, to realize that we can learn from it and we can get beyond it. In the name of Jesus, let the chains that seem to bind us serve only to remind us that they fall powerless behind us because we praise you and we live for you and we walk by faith in, for, and with you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed tonight, I'm just simply going to ask you, is there something you tried for the Lord? Is there something you attempted for the Lord? Is it something that you feel like you fell flat on your face? Just look to the Lord. He didn't call you to be the star quarterback. He didn't call you to be the one who always hits the home run. He called you to be the one who steps up and attempts for his sake and for his glory. And if you'll do that, he will absolutely amaze you with the results. Do you know that before before Brother Franklin began to preach the glorious gospel, Somebody came to his town and preached at the church he was at and gave an altar call. And from the back row where the men were singing the bass and the baritone, he walked down, gave his heart to the Lord. I said, Franklin, I meant Billy Graham. Billy Graham became what I personally believe is the greatest soul winner that this world has known since the days of the early church. It's attributed that nearly a half a billion people have come to know Jesus Christ because of him. Oh, he wasn't very deep in his doctrine and theology. But he was good at what he did. John the Baptist wasn't very deep in his either. 
Every day, every day he preached the same message. Repent. Repent, every one of you. He preached the same message and they came to him. First in the dozens and then in the hundreds and then there's no telling how many. And as a voice crying out in the wilderness, he proclaimed Jesus to them. I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me who's going to baptize you with fire. Somebody say amen. Can you imagine what would happen if we just stopped trying? How horrible would that be? I want to pray for you. I'll let you go. You got that look in your eyes. I don't know what it is. Might be a taco. Might be a burger. I don't know. But I'm going to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus. Not just them, God, for me as well. I ask you, help us to never give up the willingness to try. Help us to never, ever stop trying one more time. Just one more time. And if that doesn't work, God, help us to try one more time. And let us keep trying, God, until we find, God, the success, God, of what we're attempting to do for you. Not to necessarily be the biggest and the best at whatever, but, Father God, Lord, just to be the one who didn't stop but kept on trying for you. Help us in Jesus' name. Even if we've quit like John Mark, Help us to have that moment in our life when, God, that's been taken care of and now we're useful for ministry for you. Keep your hand upon us this week, God. Keep us safe. Help us to share with anyone that asks us of the reason of hope that we have, God, Lord, and cause it to make them hungry and thirsty for you and your righteousness. And until we meet again at the appointed hour, God, we give you praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' holy name, and everybody said, Amen.